This is Pastor Paul's Saturday morning Bible chat, and we'll chat about the Bible. So let me know if you're here. Say hi in a little while when we go to the interactive time. I'll ask you to tell me where you're joining from. Um, but for now, just tell me you can hear me and that the sound's okay and all that, and, and we'll get rolling. It's, it's uh, my Saturday morning Bible chat. I'm going to talk a little bit. I usually take some of the videos I've done through the week and talk about them a little bit more in depth. So I did a video this week about abortion. Hi, Ryland. How are you? Oh, man, I got to get, I got to get a book to you. I got to get a book to you. We got to figure out how to coordinate that. Okay, sound is good. Thank you. So good to see everybody joining. So I did a video that took off a little bit yesterday about abortion, which is a topic that most people like you never talk about. But I think we have to talk about it because the events of January 6th, and I don't think this is a stretch to say, can be tied directly back to the politiz politization, politicization, I don't know what that word is, the politicizing of abortion. And abortion is an issue that the right wing and Republicans have used to create fear and manipulate Christian voters since 1979. And yes, I can tell you the exact year they did it because they wrote each other letters about it. And these exist in history. And we know who did it. It was a guy named Paul Weyrich working with a man named Jerry Falwell, who we now know as Jerry Falwell Sr. because his son has now become a, a purveyor of cabin boys in and, uh, oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, Franklin Graham for this week and also um, a little bit about, sorry, I'm making a note so I don't forget what I want to talk about. Um, and this pastor that was cursing everyone this week. All right. So... YouTube guys, let me know you're here. If you see me looking up, I, my monitor's behind there. So I'm, I'm working on the perfect setup and hopefully I'll find it one day. But this way I can, I've got both cameras for TikTok and YouTube right here. But if I wanna see what people are chatting on YouTube, I have to look up there. And if I wanna see what we're chatting on TikTok, it's down here. So bless you guys. Let me, let me say a little prayer to kick us off and, uh, and then we'll go. I'm so happy. My name is, is Paul, by the way, and I'm known as Pastor Paul, the TikTok pastor on TikTok. I'm known as the nonpartisan evangelical as well, which is a podcast I do. So I'm really glad you're with me today and uh, hope we can say a few things that, that bless you. And what I try to do is take some of the hard topics of Christianity, the ones that your church tends to not want to talk about very much and talk about them, and particularly in light of how evangelical Christianity and somewhat Catholic, Catholic Christianity have been right in the middle of our politics of our country. Yeah, thank you for following me, G-Man Lib. Love it. Thank you. So yeah, and thank you, uh, Vanessa Summers, who shared the live video. So yeah, as much as you can follow and share, this is great. But as much as the evangelical and the Catholic Church, but particularly evangelicalism, which is where I'm from, is right in the center of our politics, I think it's really important that we talk about these things today. So I just pray a blessing of the spirit of heaven to come and be with us as we talk and to connect us together, to connect our hearts and spirits together, to, to feel for one another, to love one another, to, to be um, just tied together today and be tied to heaven. By heaven, I just mean something that's mysterious and supernatural and outside ourselves. Um, we can, I have a lot of people that come on and say there is no God. And so I'm fine with that. And I love that I'm connecting with a lot of my atheist and agnostic friends. But I truly believe we all have some innate sense that there's, there's something out there. There's something bigger out there. And, you know, they say the universe is expanding. That's a scientific understanding I have, that the universe is expanding. And my question has always been expanding into what? You know, the, so there has to be a bigger container that, that contains the universe. And so to me, God as a personified being makes as much sense as anything I've heard. And, and so my tradition is to know God as, 
as a personified being and, and with a character that relates to us like, like a father. And I know for some of us, that is a tough personification. And so I just, I really respect that. But that idea of there being a God who just wants the best for me, just, it just works for me. So I hope that's okay. And I hope that doesn't create pain for you. But if you see God differently, or you see that, that container of the universe differently, that's okay. We can still walk and talk together. I'm, I'm not demanding you believe the way that I believe. And so in my belief system, then that being, that personification of God it, it, in, inhabited human form in Jesus. And I believe that the story of Jesus is a, is a story that shows us the character of this God being that's out there. And again, I, I don't believe that you have to say a sinner's prayer about Jesus to be my friend or be good or be moral. Um, I just want you to um, know my tradition and how I'm looking. So I pray the blessing of heaven over you and your household today. Yeah, so amen. So let's, let's start. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up the Bible here. So this week I talked about abortion and how I believe the right-wing evangelical and, and Catholic belief that abortion uh, usurps all other things is wrong. And then I'll have Christians tell me, well, I don't think it usurps all other things. But every time I say anything about anything in politics that doesn't support Donald Trump or the Republican Party in, in whole... I will have four, five, six, ten people say, well, you're for killing babies um, or some version of that. How can you be for a party that's for killing babies? And so I want to address the issue of abortion. One thing I want Christians to know is that it's a, it's a political tool that's been used for decades to manipulate you, um, but also uh, to know what the Bible actually says about abortion. I'm this crazy Christian that believes what we say and believe and particularly something that becomes a divisive issue where we get to call people baby killers, we should really make sure we know what the Bible says about it. So the question is, what does the Bible say about abortion? And the answer largely is nothing. The Bible really doesn't speak to abortion at all. Um, there's no verse that says, thou shalt not terminate a pregnancy. So the answer to the question is zero. Now, what happens is some people cobble together verses. There's a verse in Jeremiah that God says, I knew you um, in, your, in your mother's womb. And, and I think Psalm 139 talks about when I knit you together in your mother's womb. And then in the book of Luke, there's a story about John the Baptist leaping in his mother's womb uh, when, Jesus, when, when Mary, who was carrying the baby Jesus, walked into the room. And so they say, see, that means the fetus is alive. And I think that's, you can make that argument. I'm not saying that's invalid. But one thing I would say about that, again, if, and, and I'm talking in the case, if we think we're, we're permitted by the Bible to call people sinners and baby killers if they don't vote Republican. Uh, so when if we feel like we get to do that, we should be, make sure we know what we're talking about. And so I would say it also tells us in the New Testament that God knew us from the creation of the earth, from the very laying of the foundation of earth, God says, I knew you. So if we take the passage in Luke or Jeremiah 1 and say, see, this proves that abortion is a sin, then I could also take those verses that say God knew us from the creation of the earth. And if you take birth control, you're murdering. Or if you don't procreate, if you don't get married and have a baby, you're a murderer. So you see that there's some illogic to, to that. Um, by the way, the Bible also, the Bible personifies the fetus in those two passages. But there's other times where the Bible personifies trees and talks about trees clapping their hands and donkeys talking and rocks crying out. So it could be that this is a personification or a miraculous moment where God is talking about something. I, I believe the Jeremiah 1 passage is poetic and more of an alliteration rather than actually saying, here's a theology that the fetus is alive. And one other thing I'll note before I actually start reading the Bible is that the Jewish tradition was that life began at first breath, that a soul entered a body 
at first breath. And that was because Adam was fully formed. He had all his muscles and tissues and skin and everything else, but he wasn't alive until the breath of God came in him. And the same in Ezekiel, we see this army coming to life. And it says that they were fully formed and Ezekiel started crying because they weren't alive until breath came into them. So the Jewish tradition and some of my Jewish friends out there might try to, um, you know, tell me differently. But the, but the way I understand the Jewish tradition is they believe life begins at first breath. Um, and one more and one more thing, there are a couple of passages in the Old Testament that would seem to indicate um, there's actually one passage in Numbers that people talk about where it seems that God is giving Moses a concoction that a woman can take to create a miscarriage, and it's to be used in judgment. And then there's a passage in Exodus that talks about a man, you know, basically attacking a pregnant woman. And the passage says that if the baby miscarries, the man owns, owes a fine, but if the mother dies, the man owes, pays with his life. And so the, the, the Jewish tradition then would say the mother's life is more valuable than the unborn baby's life. So anyway, I'm just talking about what the Bible says. You can believe strongly in saving the lives of fetuses, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is there are better ways to do that ultimately than trying to pass a law to ban abortion and, as I say, criminalize pregnant women. I don't think God is like, yes, criminalize pregnant women. And I definitely don't think God is saying you get to run around calling people baby killers and chasing generations of millennials and Gen Zers from the church for your own self-righteous beliefs. So I'm not saying you're wrong to want to save the lives of unborn babies. That's a wonderful passion. I'm saying you're wrong if you're using a politicized issue like banning abortion to make yourself feel self-righteous, to chase people away from the message of the Bible and call people baby killer. So let me tell you why I believe that. Um, Matthew chapter 5 is a wonderful passage where we get uh, the sermon from Jesus called the Beatitudes. And when Jesus preached the sermon, it was radical. It was, it was anti-establishment. Jesus was the, the most anti-establishment hippie guy who had ever existed in, in history up to the time. And so he tells this radical sermon of the Beatitudes and starts talking about that actually, you know, it's the poor that are going to inherit the earth and the meek and all of these things. And so he has this interesting interaction with people in Matthew chapter 5. Um, and so I see somebody saying they hear the heartbeat very, very early. Yes, but does that mean that being has a soul? That's the question. But, but again, let's not focus on, let's focus on the bigger question. How do you actually save that baby's life? Passing a law to ban abortion doesn't do it. We know this. South Korea has banned abortion for 60 years, and they still have more abortions per capita than the United States. The question, ma'am, is do you want to save babies or do you want to win political battles? Do you want to save babies or be self-righteous and condemning and driving generations from the church? That's the question I'm asking. Let's not get into these silly particulars. If you want to save that baby's life, there are great ways to do it. Like go after poverty. Systemic poverty is, is the number one indicator of somebody that's going to have an abortion. So let's go after poverty. That's the way you actually save babies' lives. So let's, let's not get distracted with these little intricacies. I'm saying even if you believe that, does the Bible say banning abortion is the most important thing to God that usurps everything else? and gives you the right to call people baby killer and chase people away from the gospel. So let's stay focused on the question. So to that, then Matthew 5, Jesus says this. So this, so this is for you. If you believe that abortion is a sin and a horrible thing, listen to this from Matthew 5, 21. This is Jesus talking. He says, you have heard it said, that you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool or raka, it says actually in the Bible. I love that word, raka, if you say raka, yeah, um, then you will be liable to the hell of fire. Hear this. Hear this, whoever says you fool, whoever says baby killer will be liable to the hell 
of fire, to the hell of Gehenna. It's, it's it, to the Gehenna of fire. It's what it's actually saying. It's talking about the dump heap outside the town of Jerusalem. And so he goes on to say this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go. Be first reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So here's the thing that Jesus is saying. It's like, Okay, you heard, you say don't murder. He would always take the religious people's premises and 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 use that as a setup, and then he would knock it down. You hear it say don't murder. Great, that's awesome, wonderful, all for it. But I'm telling you that if you hate someone in your heart, you are guilty of murder. And if you call your brother a fool, if you call people names, if you use the term baby killer loosely, you are the one that should be under judgment. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's saying, let's stop living in this idea of rules, because here was the thing about murder. The, the tradition of, of the religious system of murder was, if I beat you to the edge of your life, but you don't die, I haven't committed a sin. I've gone right up to the edge of line. If that guy had died, I would have sinned. But since he lived, I didn't sin. But Jesus is saying, if in your heart, you kind of wanted the guy to die, or you just sort of have a murderous spirit in your heart, you are just as guilty as the murderer. And I think, my friends, I'm telling you that you can be passionate about saving the life of a fetus, but it gives you the right to hate people in your heart. Jesus would say, you know what? You're just as guilty as they are. Clear your heart first and work from a position of a clean heart. And then you can start to work through the process of trying to save babies. And, and if you're able to change the heart of culture so that the law changes downstream, this is like smoking. Think about smoking. You know, smoking uh, was a very prominent thing in the 50s. By the way, make America great again. Let's go back to the 50s when everybody was smoking and dying of cancer. Uh, oh, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Um, you can... But what happened is the heart of our culture changed against smoking and laws begin to change downstream of that. So changing laws doesn't fix things, but changing hearts. So if you can turn the heart of culture about that baby, and by the way, most people in our culture are against abortion and very few of our politicians are for late-term abortions. In fact, what has turned uh, data to show that now more people support abortion than when Donald Trump took over as president and more people support late-term abortions than when Donald Trump took over as president because when the states of Alabama and Missouri passed really draconian anti-abortion laws, it caused support for abortion to shoot up in America. So you see our work that we're doing to be very staunchly anti-abortion is actually leading to greater support for abortion in our country and greater support for late-term abortion. So what you're doing, my friends, no matter how passionate you are about it, is not working. And by the way, if you look at the data for millennials, they're leaving the church in droves because mostly of our political stances. Is it worth it or is there a better way? That's the question I'm asking. So Jesus said, if you're, you're right on murder, but you have anger in your heart, you're just as guilty as the murderer. And then John, one of the disciples who was the, maybe the closest friend of Jesus to whatsoever, he said it this way in, first, in the book of 1 John chapter 3. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So if you just like have hate, if you have hate for people in your heart because of abortion, God is saying, you need to work on that hate. That's more important than passing a law to ban abortion. And John says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You, you don't have the zoe of heaven in you if you're using the, the issue of abortion to cause you to hate people. You are a murderer in the eyes of the kingdom of heaven. I know that's a harsh teaching, but I want you to hear that. You can think I'm all right on abortion and I just hate people because of it. And God is saying, oh my dear, let's work on that. Okay, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers or for others. But if anyone has the world's goods, so now here we're going to go in my next premise. One of the things that 
is terrible about the abortion agenda is that it's been used to, to make this right-wing Christianity become very prevalent in the church. And right-wing Christianity tends to press against our corporate heart for taking care of the poor. And my premise is there are zero verses about abortion in the Bible. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that tell us to take care of the poor take care of the foreigner, take care of the marginalized, the outcast, the widow, hundreds of them compared to zero for abortion. Jesus never once mentioned abortion. And I'll get to that more, but so now John has set up the premise here in first John that if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And the way you prove your life is to be willing to lay down your life for someone. And by laying down your life, that doesn't just mean for dying with somebody who's in danger of violence, but it also means laying down your desires and needs to serve somebody else, because that's going to transform the world more than passing a law to ban something. So John says this, you know, you're a murderer if you, if you hate. And so he, then he turns to this in verse 317. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, guys. I'm this, this is just so important to me, and I'm so excited so many of you are here. But 1 John 3.17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Hear this verse, this pair of verses here. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, and that would be humanity around him in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? If you have a lot and are not willing to look at those suffering around you, how can you have the love of God in you? And then he goes on to say, let us not love Love is not a word or talk. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. You want to show you love God? Take care of the poor. And as I said in my video, taking care of the poor is not having a backpack drive before school starts. Let me take this a step further. When we talk about taking care of the poor, what a lot of people say is, you know, I did this for this poor person last year. You don't know that I don't care about the poor. So here's the problem with that statement. The Bible from end to end shows that God, yes, judges us as individuals and in our hearts, but he also judges us corporately and holds us responsible for the corporate heart of our, our collection, our sphere. And so that includes our city, our region, our state, and our country. Don't believe me? You think I'm wrong? It actually is in the Bible again and again and again and again and again. Let me take you to the words of Jesus again in the book of Matthew 11, where Jesus is it's called the woes to the city pack passage. And so I'll just take one here from Matthew 11, 22 and 23. He says, but I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than you. He's talking to Chorazin and Bethsaida. And then he says, and you Capernaum. Now Capernaum is the city where Jesus spent more time than any other city when he was on earth. And he says to you Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So this is a communal corporate rebuke. Jesus is saying to the city of Capernaum, man, you saw a ton of miracles. You saw me love people. You saw me do my stuff and you didn't change. And so it's going to be better on judgment day for Sodom than for you. So first off, let me tell you that this verse is the only time Jesus ever seems to mention homosexuality at all. If we believe Sodom was destroyed for homosexuality, which I believe it actually wasn't. There's other evidence in the Bible that it wasn't, but, but I understand why you would believe that. And so if you do believe Sodom was destroyed because of homosexuality, then hear this from the mouth of Jesus. Sodom is going to have a better judgment day than Capernaum. Let that sink in for a second. I'll, I'll wait. 
Sodom will have a better judgment day than Capernaum. So what does this mean in the context of what I'm talking about, about taking care of the poor versus voting to ban abortion? Am I supposed to vote for a party that cares about the poor, or am I supposed to vote for a party that cares about abortion and embassies in Israel and single gender bathrooms? Jesus says, Sodom is going to have a better judgment day than you, Capernaum. So here's the question. Does that mean everybody in Capernaum was evil and didn't care about the poor and all these other things? No, there were probably really good people in Capernaum. Jesus once said, oh, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets. I'm sure there are people in Jerusalem who never killed a prophet and never wanted. But God looks at us as a corporate group. And I believe that corporate heart of America is often represented in our government. So we should want our government to reflect the heart of God. And I'm telling you then to reflect the heart of God, these verses that say, you can be right on murder, but if you hate somebody, you're just as guilty as the murderer. But here's how I'm going to judge you. How did you take care of the poor? In talk, in, not just in talk and, and words, but in deed. And if we're, if, if our view of government is it should criminalize pregnant women, it should just be about low taxes for me, it should be about protection for me from those people, we're out of line with the heart of God and we're a part of a corporate heart that's out of alignment with God. And that's why 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says we need to come, turn from our wicked ways and come into alignment with God's heart and then our land will be healed. Not when we pray for those people to be have their bad behavior banned by law. Does that make sense? I'll let you guys ask questions in just a bit. Um, but so hear what I'm saying. So Jesus said, great, you're right on murder, but you still hate people and are mean to them. You're just as guilty as they are. And then John said, if you hate your brother, then you're guilty of murder. You're, you, in God's eyes, your heart is just as dark. And then John goes on to say, what you need to do is care about the poor. And if you only talk about loving in word, but don't do it in deed, then you don't love people and, and you don't represent Christ on earth. And so then one more passage I'll give you and then we'll talk more. This is Jeremiah chapter 5. Again, talking about the fact that God looks at us as corporate groups and judges our hearts. And this didn't happen once or twice. This happens over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what is the judgment that God looks at for a community of people, a city, a region, a state, your neighborhood, your community? This is from Jeremiah 5, verse 24. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go then to verse 25. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have kept good from you. So he's saying, hey, Jerusalem, you're being judged. Bad things are happening because your heart is not good. And so he, he talks about wicked men who, you know, lurk and set traps and then here's what he says. He says, their houses are full of deceit. Remember, we have a president that lies an awful lot and, and says that it's okay to lie and gets people to believe lies. Their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice. They cause they judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. They've grown fat and sleek and rich and don't care about the truth, and they don't defend the rights of the needy. If somebody's saying out there, my, my friends are hurting in the community of color, and so black lives matter, and you say, no, all lives matter or blue lives matter, are you defending the rights of the needy? We all should care about each other the same. No, there are some who are hurting more than others, and you are to care for them. You are to fight for justice for those that aren't getting justice. That is the determination if you're following God or not, not if you're against abortion. The Bible never says how your theology is on abortion will prove that you're right with God. It says, if you care for the rights of the needy, and here's what happens if we don't do that. Jeremiah 5, 29, shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord. 
And shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? Hear that, Christian. If you don't care for the least of these, the most um, put down in your community, if, if cutting my taxes is, is, you consider that a biblical principle, the Bible simply doesn't support it. And, and I'm for low taxes and I pay an accountant to help me pay the least possible, but I pay my taxes with joy because I want there to be roads and streets and parks and police and fire that do good in our community. So God says, shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord, and shall I not avenge myself on a nation such as this? And he finishes with this and think about this in terms of what's going on in our country today. Jeremiah 530, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their direction, at the direction of the prophets, and my people love it so. But what will you do when the end comes? Let me read that one more time. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? Our prophets have been prophesying falsely. Franklin Graham, I want to say a swear word so bad right now. The Pharisee of Pharisees in my book coming out and saying any Republican that voted for impeachment is Judas. That is an evil, evil saying. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their direction and my people love to have it so. This is an abject rebuke of a community of people that will do such a thing. And the Lord, the God you follow, people says, Shall I not avenge myself against these people? But here's the good news. If we repent of that, and repent means change our heart, change our direction, change our mind, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and will turn this thing around. I'm not sure this generation can repent and change. I'm thinking that that evangelical church and that mindset's probably going to have to pass away with a generation or two, and it's going to take sort of the millennials and Gen Zers to save us from it. But this is the challenge I'm bringing you today. If you believe being anti-abortion makes you a good Christian, I don't believe the Bible supports that in the slightest. In fact, I think if you're voting for your self-interest over the interest of the most needy in the community, then you're out of alignment with what the Bible says a Christian should believe. Okay, I've talked for about 40 minutes, and I'm going to stop a little bit and start. I know you guys have been commenting a lot, and I'm sorry that I haven't um, seen that. Sorry if I missed any of your comments. For some reason, I'm not on YouTube, and I don't know why. I wonder why I'm not on live. Oh, there I am. Okay. All right. Here's one thing I want you to do, and thank you, um, Amazing teaching. Thank you. Can you list the verses you spoke from? Can somebody, I can give you the verse references. Would somebody type them into the comments for me? Let me know if you would be willing to type them in and I'll give you those references because I'm not sure I know how to do it otherwise. Um, okay. So if you're here, let me know where you're from and, okay, and let me see if I can answer some of your questions. Boy, they're coming fast and we've got 150 of you on there. I hope I can meet. If you're on YouTube, let me know where you're joining from and type it into the chat. I can see what you say here and would love that. And it would let me know, I haven't had anybody jump into the chat yet on YouTube, so it would let me know that you can hear me, which sometimes I have a little bit of sound. Um, see you around. I like how this man thinks about stuff about politics. Thank you. Hi, New Mexico. Hi, Tampa, Florida. Hi, Portland, Maine. Um, I can type the verses. Okay, so let me tell you the verses. So the first is basically chap Matthew chapter 5, if you can type that in. Um, but, but mostly Matt, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. So if somebody could type that in for me. Hi, Albuquerque. Gosh, you guys are coming so fast. I'm sorry. I'm going to miss a ton of you. Georgia in the house. Georgia, we love you. We love you. We love you. Pennsylvania, we love you. There you are. You guys are awesome. Thank you 
for your work in the elections this year. Needville, Texas, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Indiana, Milpitas, California. Thank you guys. Okay, Matthew 5, 20 and 21. The next was 1 John chapter 3, um, verses 15 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, 15 through 18. 1 John chapter 3, 15 through 18, if somebody could type that in. Um, then we thank you guys. Then we have Matthew again, chapter 11. Um, and let's say from Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 24, Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 24, Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 24. Through 24. And then finally, Jeremiah five. Thank you for typing those in guys. You're awesome. Jeremiah five. 24 through 31. Jeremiah 5, 24 through 31. Can we re-watch re this on YouTube? Yes, you can. It will be on the Nonpartisan Evangelical YouTube channel, um, or you can listen to it on my podcast, which is at the Nonpartisan Evangelical Podcast, npepodcast.com. Jasmine from Tucson says, our church felt so isolated for preaching this. Thank you for sharing. Jasmine, I would recommend... If you thought this was good and you need somebody to support you, send people to my YouTube channel or pull it down and show it to them. Have them talk about it. I may not know everything and I may not be 100% right, but I'm really convinced this is the message for the season. Christian, you can be right on abortion. Be sure that you're exactly right and be 100% wrong in your murderous heart and your heart toward people. Thank you, Deb McFarland, for following me. Hi, Phoenix. Hi, Raleigh, North Carolina. NPEpodcast.com. That's the website um, and the nonpartisan evangelical YouTube channel. But I will take the live and I'll put it on the podcast at some point. And the YouTube address is the nonpartisan evangelical channel. Someday I'm going to pull all these together in one website and one name. I'm working on that right now to make it easier. Karen, thank you so much for putting all the Bible references in there. So was this good, guys? Um, and what questions do you have now? Okay, let me look at my YouTubers. Colin is here from England. Yes, hi, Colin. So glad. Do, does the sound okay, Colin? Can you hear me okay on YouTube? Um, somebody says, I doubt Pastor Paul would want that. Um, Casey says, I'm not a Christian anymore. I would say I'm just a theist living day to day. Hey, <laughs> with the abuse that's been done, and particularly in the evangelical church, I'm okay with you pursuing God. Just don't give up pursuing your faith and your spirituality because just because human beings are a poor representation of God, whatever, whatever God looks at. So I'm okay with you chasing God because you'll find I believe if you chase God, so people ask me, you know, are you a universalist? And the question is not really, are you a universalist? Does, do all roads lead to heaven? The question is, is God big enough to chase down any road to find you? Now, that's not my line. I'm stealing that from a book called The Shack. But God is big enough to find you where you are. The story of the prodigal son was the dad running to the son. And I believe God will run and find you if you look for him. Um, hi, Colin. Let me know if the sound is okay on YouTube. Thank you. You're the first Christian to validate that for me. Awesome. That, that makes my heart come alive when I hear those things. How do you feel Christ would think of universal basic income? Um, you know, I, universal basic income is, is an arguable thing. I've become more of a believer in it, particularly since COVID and the pandemic. Um, I think you can argue over issues like that and still be a Christian, still be a good moral person. Um, I think Jesus would want basic needs to be taken care of. No question about that. He would care more about that than people getting wealthy. Um, but he would... Um, oh, what was I going to say? Sorry, I just got distracted by something on YouTube. Would Jesus be for universal basic income? I can't say that with, without, a de without any doubt, but I can say he would want the poor to be taken care of. And so I think there's an argument to be made that universal basic income can do it. We can argue on these things. Hi, Colin. 
and and it's okay to argue and disagree. I'm not saying we all have to leave agreement on one side and come to the other side. We need to really think about why we believe what we believe. And if we call ourselves a Christian, a follower of Christ or one who represents Christ, we need to make sure that what we're doing is actually representative of Christ in the Bible, not just a, a reciting of right-wing media and, okay, thank you, Colin, not just reciting right-wing media and what we've been taught in the church all our lives, okay? Hi, West Tennessee. Good to see you. I'm sorry, I'm missing so many messages. I don't want to chase anyone or anything. Well, that's fine. You go for that. You, you just go for what's in your heart, and I'm okay with it. And if it's, and I hope it's okay that I believe the way I believe too. That's, again, it's part of the, part of the problem. What happens a lot is I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm in, now I'm totally out and I'm throwing it all out and I'm angry and I hate the people who do it and I'm going to mock them. Like, don't buy into like, let's throw out the baby with the bathwater. We can say, okay, this doesn't work for me anymore. I'm going to head this direction. But I can be okay with people still believing here, but I can call them to be empathetic and not angry and divisive the way it's become. So be careful that you don't do the big swing and just say, okay, I got hurt over here, or I'm angry, or I don't like this, and so I'm going to go clear to the other side and now become an advocate against that. That's, that's a real danger, and your heart just becomes the other side of the same coin of I was here, and now I'm way over here, and I'm going to tell these people they're horrible. And secondly, it, it'll never change anybody else. So you don't have to pursue God. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm, I'm mostly talking to the people that have a faith and a spirituality. And if you don't, that's okay. We can still be friends. And I think you can still be as moral a person as anybody else. So that's not my judgment. But just know that in this conversation, I'm talking to people that, that have a spirituality and a faith. Okay? So I hope that's okay. You give me hope that not all Christians are bad. Oh, my friend Kristen is here. Hi, Kristen. Kristen gave me a Gunger song this week that I love. Um, okay, on YouTube, NC says, can you tell us how only caring about abortion is selfish? Um, so I, MC, maybe the first thing I would say is like, can't go back and watch this live later because I've kind of addressed that. But the idea of selfish, so... The problem is perhaps that the idea of, of caring about abortion isn't selfish, but what happens is it's become a political issue where now many people who kind of became conservative or are conservative around the issue of abortion then feel like they have to buy the whole platform. And so if, if my abortion makes me an ultra extreme conservative, my, my stance on abortion makes me an, an ultra extreme conservative and now because what I hear from people is, I'm I'm a Christian, therefore I have to report. I have to vote Republican. Sorry, I'm I'm talking faster than I'm thinking, and I have to vote Republican because of the biblical issues of abortion, gay marriage, taxes, Israel, single gender bathrooms. Now now I'm starting to conflate political policy issues with biblical issues, and that's the real problem I see with the politi politicizing of abortion as an issue, it's made us start to believe all Republican issues are now biblical issues, that Christians have to be staunchly anti-tax at all time or you're not a Christian. And the Bible simply doesn't support that. So selfish is if abortion causes me to vote Republican and I, and I hate Democrats and I call them baby killers. And I can't recognize that in some ways the Democratic Party represents a care for the poor. Now, trust me, they don't always do it perfectly. And sometimes it, that is politicized as well. I understand that. But if one party is the party of being pro-Israel, anti-tax and pro-abortion, then we have to recognize that the other side is like, okay, I may agree with some of those things, but the primary thing for me is making sure poor people and, and the marginalized are taken care of. And that's a wonderful heart. And that's actually mentioned in the Bible many, many, many more times than these Republican right-wing issues, which I think there's only one verse in the Bible that people use to do the support Israel thing. And there are zero verses in the Bible that talk about um, it being a sin to end a pregnancy. Now, people have cobbled together verses to say, see, this proves it that way. But there actually is no verse that says ending a pregnancy is sin. Um, so we have to be, uh, have to be honest about that. 
MC says, thank you for clarifying on YouTube. You're welcome. Uh, Noah says, hello there, Pastor Paul. Love your lessons. Learning a lot from you this week. Thank you. <clears throat> on TikTok, Miss Danvers uh, says to therapies who therapize, I love you. You're awesome. It says, thank you. I think contending ideas always help people sort out their own beliefs. Absolutely. Audra Smith says, Jesus was a socialist. I, I, I don't like to, that's such an incendiary term now. And for many Republicans has become such a boogeyman word. I don't like to go there necessarily, but uh, I would say at times um, the idea of Jesus being this unfettered free market capitalist isn't actually supported in the Bible. And some of the things he says do sound a little more socialist than capitalist. So yeah, is it more important to think of others over ourselves? Absolutely, 100%. The Bible is clear. If you're not, what did, for, what did it say in that first John passage today? Let's love not in word and talk, but in deed and truth. So yes, serving others. Now, I'm a big believer. I do coaching. Let me do a commercial real quick. Yes, I do well-being coaching. And so if you've been thinking about having a life coach, a spiritual coach, send me a direct message on TikTok or comment on YouTube and say, I'd like to know more. Give me an email address or something and I'll contact you. And um, so if you're looking for a life coach, I'm the guy and I do this. So send me a direct message on TikTok or comment or email me through YouTube or through my website at npepodcast.com. But one of the things I would say in life coaching is, if you're not taking care of yourself. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you don't love yourself, can you truly love your neighbor in a way that's selfless? I think you have to take care of yourself to be powerful for others. So let's not, you know, sometimes we get in this sort of self-flagellation as Christians, like I'm going to take care of others. And, and we end up depleting ourselves and we break down. So take care of yourself because that makes you have resources to take care of others. I'm not sure about Christianity, but I'm sure of Christ and his work. Love that. I'm on board with that. Sylvester asks, is it possible for us to love unconditionally? It's, it's a battle I think we're supposed to do. Now, loving unconditionally and, and judging the works of somebody aren't necessarily separate. Because I hear a lot of people, you know, when I'll say something about President Trump is, is pretty bad, and I think he's a pretty bad person. I think the fruit of his life show somebody that has a really troubled heart. They'll say, judge not lest you be judged. Yes, I cannot judge the Christianity and the relationship with God of somebody, but I can judge their works and their fruit, particularly if they're hurting other people, I'm to stand in. So, but but Jesus was able to say, even to those executing him, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So that's unconditional love. Even in the midst, you can say, hey, this is wrong, but I'm going to love you anyway. It's a fight of our heart. Um, I did a post about Rush Limbaugh and how I felt bad that he had cancer. But, but be, being honest about Rush Limbaugh, what he has done to our culture and, and in the media that he has wrought and all those that have followed in his footsteps has been so damaging to relationships. So I want to make sure that I love Rush and, and have empathy for him battling lung cancer while at the still, still standing for truth and saying, and by the way, Rush has destroyed a whole bunch of families out there. And, and I hope that he's in touch with that and can repent of that and, and uh, bring himself to some peace in that. All right, we're going to wrap it up here in just a few minutes. By the way, guys, my wife and I do a live stream together at 1030. Today, we're going to talk about um, our Christian brothers and sisters in church leadership. I led a church for 10 years. Guys, it is time for you to speak up. It is not a time to be silent. My wife and I will talk about that at 1030 Pacific coming up. Thoughts on tithing and how it's preached in the modern evangelical church. Well, tithing is not a command of the New Testament church, I believe. The thing about money is this. Is money controlling you or are you controlling money? And if tithing is a way 
if, if I tithe because I want to get this blessing from God out of it and I want to look big in my church and I want to have some control in my church, then tithing is a sin for you. You, you ought to, to pull that back and break that down while you're doing it. The question is, are you controlling money or is it money controlling you? And so I think giving to churches, giving to not-for-profits is absolutely a must. In the Old Testament, um, the, the Jewish people were required to give 30% of their income, 10% for tithes to take care of the temple and the priest, 10% for sin offerings, and 10% for gifts for the poor. So um, let's not get hung up on 10%. I think the question is, how is my money being used to love others? And remember, this corporate judgment over people by God that we talked about today is for how are you caring for the poor, the foreigner, and the marginalized? Those that have trouble making their way in your culture, how are you helping them to make a way? Oh my gosh, guys, I'm not going to get to your comments at all. You can DM me with questions and I'll try to get to those. Um, my TikTok page is growing so fast. I just love you guys. I'm, I'm so in awe of people following me and saying your great comments. And I'm so sorry, I'm just not able to get back to everyone, but, but I try to get through my direct messages. So send me a direct message. Noah says, I'm sure you answered earlier, but why is it for Republicans to protect Israel at all costs? Not saying they're not important, but in the Bible, it says that Israel will need to defend themselves. Yeah, this idea, uh, it comes from a promise to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. And that's been transferred to the country of Israel. Um, for Christian right-wing people today. And I don't actually believe that's what the Bible says. The Bible would also indicate, and some people disagree with this theological construct, but we're all sons of Abraham. And so therefore we are Israel to some degree. Now, I don't want that to go to an anti-Semitic degree. I think we're supposed to care for, for Jewish people. I also think we're supposed to care for Islamic people because God also made promises over Ishmael in our Christian Bible. And so to hate any of those people is to be outside the construct of who God wants us to be. But the idea that we're to give Israel unlimited amount of funds, the nation of Israel unlimited amount of funds, and let them do anything they want when they do some things that look pretty evil to me, there's no way that's supported in the Bible. And we need to understand that some of our issues in the Middle East aren't necessarily just because Islamic, Islamically um, predominantly Islamic countries hate us because we're Christian or because we support the Jewish nation of Israel. Some of it is because America and the West and even Israel have done some pretty terrible things to people in the Middle East. We propped up dictators in those countries that, that really abused their people. And so some of the hatred of us comes pretty naturally. If, if another country, you know, we get angry that Russia those of us who are reasonable and thoughtful, we get angry that Russia has been trying to inject itself into our elections. Think about how you would feel if Russia propped up a dictator in America and that dictator could kill your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister with impunity. How would you feel about that country? So we need to be careful. So Noah, hopefully that's an answer to your question. I, I think to impose this as a Christian issue, you either defend Israel at all cost or you're not a Christian. The Bible simply does not support that. Colin says the Labor Party in Britain was founded by Christians. It makes no sense to me that so many Americans treat them as a contrast, as contrasting ideologies. Thank you for your words, Paul. I agree, Colin. I agree. Linz says, I've just discovered your TikTok and I'm so pleased to hear logic and Christianity coexist. Love it, Lynn. Share it with others. Follow it, please. Um, yeah, I have a newsletter I do as well on my website at npepodcast.com. Someday I'm going to have a pastorpaul.com website and, and uh, I need rebranding big time so this isn't so confusing. Guys, I'm sorry. So many great comments. So thank you, Beige, for sharing npepodcast.com. Um, Miss Danvers says to none of your damn business. Huh? Not really. That's a very subjective view. None of your damn business says thank you for bringing light. Thank you. None of your damn business. And Miss Danvers, I'm sorry. You feel like it's not. It's not light. Um, I believe that at at very least, what we should be able to do is think about it. 
the thing, one of the real things that's wrong in the Christian and particularly evangelical churches we're, we're being taught. We now know everything there is to know. And if you argue with that, you're outside the norm of Christianity. And that shutting down of thought, again, is extra biblical. It's not the Bible. Jesus said to the religious leaders, woe to you guys, because you've taken the way, taken away the key to knowledge. God likes for us to think and be smart, grow. We should be the smartest, most thoughtful, creative people on the earth if we truly want to see this creative force of heaven be prevalent on the earth. Now, I'm not saying Christians are smarter or more creative. I'm just saying, if we're saying being Christian means you shouldn't be searching out, asking questions, chasing truth, you're just wrong. And by the way, I don't think truth is like a gold nugget to find and dig up and then go, ooh, I found it. I think truth is a never-ending search. I think God is always, God in my my. I think there's always new facets of the character of God being revealed in a season. All right, I'm going to have to go here in just a bit. Um, let me do one more commercial for you guys. I've got a book, and I'm, I'm putting this out there not because I want to be famous for my book, but because I think this book is really important. If you saw what happened on January 6th and wonder why that happened, I think you should read this book. It's called Joseph Comes to Town When the Religious Right Becomes Religiously Wrong. You can see it on my website at nppodcast.com. You can order it on Amazon or you can order it straight from my website. Why do I think this book is important? Because this is my parable of what, what Jesus would say to the church were he on earth today. And I believe his words would not be kind to the evangelical church. That's why I say when the religious right becomes religiously wrong. So I want you to have this book, not because I want to be rich and famous. And <laughs> this book has done anything but make me rich and famous. It's cost me some friends. It's cost me uh, a lot. But I think it's a really important book for the season. What would Jesus say to the right-wing church today? This is what I believe it would say. So Amazon, you can get it. Give me a review on there, or you can get it on my website, npepodcast.com buy a few, give it to a friend. I think you'll really enjoy it. The people who have read it tell me they really enjoy it as a story that you'll be entertained. Some tell me they didn't want it to be over and I love that. But it, it'll just give you insight into where Jesus and it heart is today. And let me tell you one other thing. If you want the audio version of it, go to my website, nppodcast.com. So there's a Joseph novel tab on there and it'll tell you all this stuff. But if you want the audio version, you can click on that Patreon button in the upper right-hand corner. And if you join our Patreon, NPE Patreon community, you'll get for free the audiobook series on this. And now it's not quite done. I'm going to be doing segment seven tomorrow, um, and it'll be going up this week. But if you click on that Patreon button, you can hear Joseph comes to town in audio. And I would love to hear your experience of it. Okay. If you just joined me on TikTok, make sure you follow on TikTok. Share my content with others, if you would. I would really appreciate it. And if you if you missed some of this, you can go to YouTube, the Nonpartisan Evangelical channel, or to my website, npepodcast.com, Nonpartisan Evangelical, npepodcast.com, and I'll put it on there as a podcast as well. But it'll be on YouTube, on my channel, and on my podcast website. Probably by Monday, it'll be on there. But the live will be on YouTube in just a few minutes if you want to go over there and watch it. Last thing, and then I'll pray and then we'll go. My wife and I come back in a half an hour, 1030 Pacific, and we do a live show together. And today we're going to talk about Christian leaders and it being time for them to speak out in light of what happened on January 6th. And leaders not speaking out is really hurting our hearts. So I hope you'll join us. That's at 1030 Pacific, which is in about 27 minutes right here on TikTok right there on YouTube. Hope you'll join us. We'll see you guys again. So God bless these households. I speak shalom blessing over you and your household. That means your family and your, your, it's called an oikos. That word is in Greek. It means 
every sphere where you have influence, everybody you interact with on a regular basis, I pray blessing over that, over those relationships, over the health, over the joy in those spheres of influence. Okay? Love you guys.